Introducing our host, Fred Swanica, in conversation with iconic global leaders. Welcome to The Pathway. Welcome to The Pathway again. Um, hey, we are, we're joined by David Brooks, who's a very good friend of mine, uh, and uh, one of the, God, I'd say, the greatest contemporary philosophers of our time. Uh, David, as many of you know, graduated from the University of Chicago and then began his career initially, you may not know, as a police reporter, actually. Uh, and then he went on to write for the Washington Times, became an op-ed editor and went for the Wall Street Journal as a senior editor of the Weekly Standard, uh, and of course, the New York Times, um, where he spends a lot of his time today. Um, and uh, he's, one, he's the best-selling author of five critically acclaimed, acclaimed books. He's a noted commentator on PBS, NPR, and NBC. Uh, but most of all, I would say that David is generally one of the most thought-provoking individuals that um, exists today, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm really honored to call him a friend. So, uh, David, uh, such a pleasure to have you uh, on the show, and it's, it's great to see you again. Welcome to the, to the Pathway. Happy to be with you. You expand my mind. <laughs> now, David, uh, you know, here in the room, uh, we're building a global community of people who care a lot about their mission in life. Uh, you uh, have a, you know, from a lot of conversations um, and from, you know, a lot of talks you've given, uh, you have a particular view about that, about what our mission in life should be. Uh, and you shared this view at the, the commencement speech you gave at Dartmouth in 2015. So let's watch that for a minute. Uh, just to just to jog your memory about about this. Well, your fulfillment in life will not come from how well it, you explore your freedom, and keep your options open. That's the path to a frazzled, scattered life, in which you try to please everyone and end up pleasing no one. Your fulfillment in life will come by how well you end your freedom. By the time you hit your thirties, you will realize that your primary mission in life is to be really good at making commitments. So you talk about um, making commitments, right? You believe that our primary mission in life is to make commitments. Can you talk about the four big commitments that you believe we all need to make in order to find fulfillment? Yeah, most of us uh, make these four commitments. They are to a spouse and family for most of us, to a philosophy or faith, to a community, and to a vocation. And so what is a commitment? A commitment is falling in love with something and then building a structure of behavior around it for those moments when love falters. So Orthodox Jews love their God, but they keep kosher just in case. We need these behavior to keep us on track. Uh, at times when you're a teacher, you'll be exhausted and you lose your love of teaching, but you've made a commitment to this thing and your fulfillment will come at, on the far side of a period of unhappiness in most of our professions. It's when you've battled through something. And one of the things you need in order to get there is the right definition of freedom, the right definition of freedom. We sometimes think that freedom means absence of constraint, that I'm free when I have no strings attached to me. But that's a way to lead a, a scattered life, uh, an aesthetic life, where you measure each moment, am I happy, am I bored? And that's ultimately just a series of moments that doesn't add up to anything. The better kind of freedom is freedom of capacity, so if you want to learn to play the piano, you have to chain yourself down to the piano and practice every day. And so that's a different kind of freedom. And I think it's a better kind of freedom to shoot for, the freedom to be able to do things. And so in this paradoxical way, it's your chains that set you free. You choose the chains that are right for you. You tie yourself down. And then on the far side of, of struggle, uh, through your commitment, you achieve a kind of fulfillment. So in a way, you're saying that in order to um, actually progress towards your fulfillment, you have to give up your freedom and to commit to things that, you know, uh, you may, uh, um, might, 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 might remove some of your degrees of freedom. That, that's essentially what you're saying. Yeah, and we, we overvalue freedom. And any of us who have kids know when you have a child, you've really lost a lot of freedom. Uh, maybe you wanted to go play tennis every weekend, but suddenly you're committed to the kid. The kid wants to play, so you take the kid out. And what you find 
is that you love your kid more than you love tennis. And so you're surrendering to a higher form of love. And love always involves commitment. Love isn't love if, if it's not a committed love. If, if you say, oh, I love you now, but maybe I'll stop loving you tomorrow. That's not love. That's not who we think of as love. So and then if you love your kid, you start sacrificing yourself for your kid. And you're a little less selfish than you were. And so it's in this way that you begin to improve and, and you become a slightly better person. Not, none of us have become perfect through parenthood or through service to students or whatever, or employees. But we're a little less selfish than we used to be. And I think that little less selfishness comes from falling in love something and then serving that something rather than just loving yourself, which is always there. <laughs> so you're saying freedom is overrated, right? If we want to really uh, find fulfillment in life, we have to uh, be willing to actually sacrifice and, and, and give ourselves yes. to something that uh, is perhaps a, a higher calling um, or, or, you know, than, than we might normally do. Now, one of the commitments you mentioned is, is to a vocation. Uh, what's the difference between a career and a vocation? And, and when do you know that you found a vocation? Well, a career is something you do because it serves your interests. <laughs> you have a certain value in the marketplace and you sell that value for the, to the highest bidder. That's a career. And a lot of people have a career. But a, a vocation is something you're called to do. And the, when you set out in life, you don't, the wrong question to ask is, what do I want from life? Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist in Austria in the 1930s, used to ask that question, what do I want from life? Then the Nazis took over his country. He was sent to a concentration camp. And he realized that's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, what does life want from me? Because life puts you in situations. And so the question to ask is, what's, what problem is out there that I'm uniquely qualified to solve? And so one of my heroes is a woman named Frances Perkins. And she, in the 1910s, she was sort of a community organizer, an activist. And she was in New York City. And she saw a fire in the top floor of an office building. And it was uh, called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. It was one of the most famous fires in American history. The women who were in this factory as seamstresses were trapped and 100 and some odd died. 63 rather than burned to death threw themselves out the windows. And Perkins watched them jump to their deaths rather than getting burned to death. And that was her moment of agency. That was her call within a call. And she realized, labor safety and worker rights, that's what I'm going to devote my life to. And at that moment, she knew how she was being called. And so our vocations are not something we create. They're something we're called to do by circumstances, by a problem that we feel some urgency to solve. Mm -hmm. So in a way, um, you, you don't choose a vocation. A vocation chooses you, right? You, where, where you meet that moment of obligation where you either move towards that opportunity to really make a difference um, or, or you ignore it. And, and when you, you find yourself being drawn to something that very often is bigger than you, then that's, that's a vocation. Whereas if it's something that is much more self-centered and about you, then that's more like a job, that's a career. That's, that's what you're saying. Yeah, it's, the word vocation comes from the Catholic Church and it started with priests who were, or nuns who were called into the priesthood or, or to become nuns. And now we use it in the secular world just as well. And you have to, sometimes you're called by beauty. Um, I, uh, I read a book when I was seven called Paddington the Bear, which is a kid's book about a train, a, a bear in London. And ever since that day, I've, I've um, felt called to be a writer just because I love the activity of writing. It's just, it seems beautiful to me. My daughter walked into an ice hockey rink when she was five, and now she teaches ice hockey in California. I once read an interview with a painter who was asked, why do you paint? And she just said, I love the smell of paint. And so sometimes it's a problem that calls you, but sometimes it's a sense of beauty, and that beauty seems deep, like it, you can go into it and into it and into it. And so in that way, you're called in other ways. And so the key for anybody who hasn't found their telos, their purpose, is um, get out where the, the fish hooks are so they can catch you. And sometimes you're not gonna find a fish hook in a, sitting in a corporate office room. Sometimes you will. But I have a young man, very wise, uh, he became a teacher in New Orleans, in a poor part of New Orleans, because he figured, well, there are a lot of problems in this poor neighborhood. 
one of them will grab me. And so he went to where the mm -hmm. problems are and he was grabbed. He now works with uh, helping uh, children and their families relate to schools. And so you got to go mm -hmm. out where the fish hooks are. Mm -hmm. Get out of your comfort zone. Put yourself in the problem zone. So if you want to really find your vocation, uh, don't sit and wait for it to come to you, but go out and, and, and put yourself in those situations where then possibly increases the likelihood that a problem, you know, uh, causes you to, know, I like what you're saying there. So David, in your 2019 TED talk, you talk about the three lies that our culture tells us. So David, which of these three lies are we most prone to telling ourselves? Well, we all tell ourselves that we know that career success doesn't lead to happiness, but that's not how we act. <laughs> we tend to act as if the career was the more, a more of the, uh, was more of us than any other part of us. And I found in COVID, when I have less time I'm doing on leisure, work fills the hours. And I actually spend more time, even though I'm the guy who gave that talk, I spend more time working and asking more of work than it can give me. And so I've had to try to learn that. But the second thing that I, I think is more American, but not exclusively American, is the lie of individualism, that I can make myself happy. We have a book we give to students who are uh, graduating from college or university, and it's, uh, it's called Other oh, Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. And it's about a lone kid who goes on a life adventure from, from school to success. And this kid has no friends in the book, he has no family, he has no connections. He's just alone. And so we tell our stories as if it's an individual journey. But when really we're enmeshed in these commitments and life is not an individual journey. And I make this distinction between happiness and joy. When you feel happiness, when you earn success, you get a promotion, your team wins the World Cup, you feel happiness. You feel big about yourself. But when you're lost in your work or you're dancing with friends or you're doing something you just love, you're, you're experiencing joy. And that's not when you feel big about yourself, that's when you totally forget about yourself. And so that's a, that's a different process. And my rule is happiness is great. I, I would love it if the United States won the World Cup, which will never happen. But, uh, uh, but it's better to aim for joy. Aim for those moments when you're dancing with friends and you're in such a whirl of excitement uh, Zadie Smith uh, once wrote about dancing that her head exploded and she just gave herself up to joy. And so shoot for that. That's better. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, and, and, you know, David Frankel, um, who you mentioned earlier, um, he wrote this book, you know, Man's Search for Meaning. And in that he talks about, um, or he says the following, he says, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it, the target, the more you're going to miss it. Um, and for success, happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And it only does so as an unintended side effect to one's dedication to a cause than oneself. Now, you make a similar um, point in the book, Second Mountain, about the two mountains you believe we must climb in order to really find fulfillment in life. Yeah, I, um, you know, I set out like everybody aiming for success. And um, I, I think that that's fine for a stage of life. When you're in your 20s, you need to establish your identity. You want to make an impact in the world. And so you set out in your profession, you want to get to a position where you can make a difference in the world. And that's totally fine. And I think I still do that. You know, I, but usually what happens in the course of that is that either you fail your career doesn't work out the way you thought it would, or you succeed and find it unsatisfying, which is what happened to me, or something comes along that uh, wasn't part of the original plan. Maybe you have a cancer scare in your 40s or something. And so suddenly you're in the valley. You're in a period of suffering. And uh, the theologian Paul Tillich said, suffering interrupts your life, these periods, and reminds you you're not who you thought you were. They, they carve through the floor of the basement of your soul and reveal a cavity below. They, and then they carve through that and reveal a cavity below. So in those moments when we're in pain, we see ourselves differently and we see deeper into ourselves. And you sort of realize that only spiritual and emotional food is gonna fill those depths. And so 
you can either be broken by tragedy, a lot of people just shrivel up, or you can be broken open and get more vulnerable. And so it's that process of how you deal with those moments that really determines whether you're ready for a bigger, wider life. And Frankel had his experience in the, in the death camps, uh, which, you know, the most awful experience you can possibly imagine. And it affected everybody in a different way, but the way it affected him was he came to view human motivation differently. Before, he thought the way economists think, that we're driven by self-interest. But afterwards, he thought, no, people are driven by, for meaning. It's really important for all of us to have a sense of meaning in our life. And so his work after the war was really about how do people find meaning and what is meaning. But can, is, is meaning uh, a luxury? I mean, you know, someone like Bill Gates, you know, he clearly climbed his first mountain when he created Microsoft and became uh, a billionaire, right? Uh, and then okay, when he turned, what, 45, 50, he, he, he turned to his second mountain, which is really to give away his wealth to solve many of society's, society's big problems. But that's Bill Gates. You know, I mean, can, can everyone climb that second mountain or is it, a, is it only a luxury that those in the uber elite can afford to do? I mean, how, 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 how do you explain this to someone who isn't, um, doesn't have the resources to just perhaps, you know, stop pursuing that personal, um, you know, uh, success that, 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 that many people, you know, are, are drawn to? Is it a luxury? Yeah. I don't think so. I, I, I've been to rich parts of the world and very, very poor parts of the world. And everywhere I've gone, I've found churches and synagogues and mosques filled with people of all levels of income, searching for meaning, searching for spiritual fulfillment, searching for a, a connection. And in most religions, the poor are closer to God because they are not distracted by the worldly distractions that rich people are subject to. And so I think every human being is searching for that sense of meaning. And as we think about the people we met in our lives who seem to radiate holiness, I think it bears no relation or maybe an inverse relationship to how much money they make. I'm thinking right now of a friend of mine named Pancho Arguiles who works in Houston, Texas. And he takes young men who've had their backs broken by construction in injuries and he gives them wheelchairs and diapers and catheters so they can lead dignified lives. And then together with them, they become local social workers. So they'll be, you'll be in a neighborhood in Houston, a bunch of guys in wheelchairs will wheel into your neighborhood to help improve your community. And he's just a guy who radiates a kind of holiness and he has not chosen a life that has, has led to wealth or he's never gonna have a foundation, <laughs> but he's chosen a life of, of connection. Uh, and so I, I think it has almost nothing or inverse relationship to wealth and it's not a luxury at all. It's an element of life for most people. So is this innate, is this a universal truth that you believe in that every person ultimately is drawn to that, uh, you know, once they've reached some level of personal success that ultimately every person seeks to have in, in a way significance to really move towards something that is bigger themselves than, than, than to make a difference? Do you think that every person at some point in their life is going to get to the stage? Yeah, or, or is born with it. Uh, I think children are intensely moral creatures, and when they feel there's chaos and purposeless to life, even at six, they, don't, they, they feel out of source. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people, a lot of bad people, <laughs> a lot of people who have committed crimes and participated in genocides. I've never met someone who didn't want to be good. And even people who've done very bad things have a story to tell about why what they did was actually good because they can't face the fact <laughs> that they're not good. And so I do think um, at a young age, people feel they, they want to f be a good son. They want to be a good student. They want to be liked by, by their friends. They want to be admired for, by people whose admiration is worthy of having. And so I think this is a strain that runs through life that we sometimes suppress. I teach at Yale off and on, and I would get calls from my students at age 25, say three years out of university. And some of them would be crushed by a career setback or a romantic failure. And it, when they were crushed and they didn't know how to deal with it because they didn't have a sense of their long-term purpose. Uh, Nietzsche said, if you have a why to live for, you can endure anyhow. Uh, and if you don't have that why, then you don't know um, 
what your purpose is and, and the, the setbacks really devastate you. And so those kids at 25 suddenly have this question, why am I here? What am I doing? And then once they find it, they become more resilient. You, um, I've heard you argue that we should live our lives for our eulogy, basically what's going to be read at our funeral, not for our resume. Yet most people live for their resume. So David, what's driving this conflict? Um, and how do you, as David Brooks, personally resolve this for yourself? Uh, well, it's driving it. Uh, we do, um, I think Soloveitchik is right. We have our ambitions and I don't deny those ambitions to make some money, to have an impact, to be celebrated, or just to be really good at our profession and to be able to use the gifts we have to have an impact. But that's different than the internal work. And for some people, the internal is the central drama of their life. It's how am I as a person? Uh, am I wise? How have I used my experiences to become wise and help people? So just for a, a concrete example, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was president of the United States in the 1950s and a great general before. And when he was young, he realized he had a terrible problem with his temper. And it just seemed like a, a horror to him that he constantly lost his temper and got angry at people. And so he spent his life internally fighting against this temper of his. And he had little tricks, like he would list all the people he hated and write their names on pieces of paper and rip them up as a way to get rid of his temper. And slowly over a lifetime, he identified his core sin, anger. He worked on it every day. And by the time he was a president, People thought he was just a very calm, cheerful guy, but that was something he constructed. And so there are ways to improve your character by the slow accumulation of good habits. And if you do the right behavior, then the right person gets formed out of that. And the problem is our, our career, we succeed in our career by putting ourselves forward, by being egotistical, by being super self-confident, but we do the inner work by being humble, uh, by recognizing what our core sin is. Um, and humility is radical self-awareness from a position of other-centeredness. It's the ability to stand outside yourself and really look in and see, this is really my weakness. And one is sort of super out and the other is super in. And it's, it's frankly hard to do both at the same time. And so, and the, the outward gets instant reward, the inner gets distant reward. And so we all have a tendency to go with the outer and, and so we, I, you invent strategies to, to work on the inner. And some people journal. Some people have friendships and clarity groups where they talk to each other. I tend to do it just by reading about people I really admire and thinking, oh, I'd really like to be like them. <laughs> and, and, and so to me, it's, it's exemplars, it's heroes who really lift my spirit up. Okay, so, so when you think about yourself, you know, the game is over for you. Right? We, You've got hopefully 40 more, 50 more years to live before we get to that point where, where they're writing your eulogy, right? Which side of the race uh, to the end right now do you think is winning so far? Your resume side yeah. or your eulogy side? You know, Adam one or Adam two? Who's winning so far with David Brooks? Yeah, I have to say it's a close race. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote this book, <laughs> my last book was called The Second Mountain, and it was about really living for the eulogy like my earlier book the road to character and yet when i'm on book tour every hour i check my amazon ranking to see how i do so like i'm still into like holy <laughs> success i i have not beaten that um but I, I hope i take walks and pull myself back and this morning i was taking a walk and thinking what is wisdom like if i'm gonna enter the you know the last God bless you for saying the last 40 or 50 years, but I, I think realistically 30 years of my life. Um, what, what should that stage be about? One of the things I've learned from people is that the people who are most fulfilled divide their life into chapters. They'll say, okay, this next five years of my life is about this. And I don't have to worry about designing my whole life. I'm just going to design this chapter. And the people who are saddest are the ones who don't design their life into chapters. They just live each day and they have a tendency to fall into ruts and not change uh, things. But if you divide your life into a three-year chapter, a five-year chapter, whatever is appropriate, then you step back. 
And, and so I was thinking about wisdom. Wisdom is not intelligence. Wisdom is somehow using some experience you've had and in a way that you can offer gifts to others. And, and so I'm, I'm going to spend the next few weeks thinking about what is wisdom and who are wise people. I, it doesn't make any use to think about it in the abstract. Think about the people who you've had in your life who are wise, who can offer you good advice or give you a different perspective. And then think, okay, how can I be a little more like them? Hmm. But right now you're saying that it's, it's a close race between Adam 1 and Adam 2. You have, you're, so it's a constant battle that you're, that you're still uh, struggling with, like probably all of us. Is that, is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, occasionally I'll meet somebody who, is, um, who really radiates other-centeredness. They live, they live lives for others. But I haven't achieved that level of enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't this kind of like what they say on the uh, on the on the on the end that you know you need to put your mask on first before you can help on others? Is that is that kind of something else going on here as well? Where uh, is it possible for you to truly give of yourself if you yourself are not self-centered, or are not in a, a safe space where you feel your basic needs are being met? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there are two forms of of how you form uh, a better character. The Aristotle was the one you described. It's, it's ex outside in. The behavior leads to the virtue. If you behave in a way that's disciplined, if you behave in a way that's giving, uh, maybe you don't love your neighbor, but if you act like you love your neighbor, eventually you'll love your neighbor. Uh, and the other side, which is frankly, I think more in the, the Christian worldview, is you purify your heart. You try to establish a right relationship with God or with the good if you're not a believer. And then you, out of a pure, if you purify your heart and try to live in a certain way and follow a certain spiritual path, then your radiating, loving heart will will do good. I found in my own life uh, a little both models can work, but I'm a little more the external. I try, you try to act it out, and and in times of hardship, you mentioned people whose lives are not safe. I find it in times of hardship, often it's the the people when you're least safe that people are the most giving. Uh, I just read a beautiful book by a guy named Tracy Kidder uh, called Strength of What Remains. And it's about this young man named Deo who lived in Burundi through the genocide years. And he, he takes us with Deo as he's fleeing from the genocide. And he's helped along every step of the way by others, often from the opposite group. And in those moments of peril, people come together in some remarkable ways. And I read another book, um, Tribes, by Sebastian Younger, and he talks to a woman who lived through the, the Kosovo Civil War, the Bosnian-Serbian War. And she says, I'm nostalgic for those days because we were together. We really helped each other out during the war. And you know things must be really screwed up now because the war was terrible. <laughs> but <laughs> it is in times of unsafety that often people are most selfless, weirdly. Mm, mm, mm. Very interesting. Really brings out the, the, the nature of human character that we can ultimately be fundamentally good at certain times. Of now, um, we're going to go soon to questions from the audience. But the last question I want to ask you before then is um, you talk often about moral character, uh, David. Can character be developed and is there a universal standard? Yeah, I, I um, used to think character was like willpower. like. I want to eat that chocolate cookie, but I'm not going to. But I, I don't really believe in that anymore uh, because I don't think any of us have strong enough willpower to resist the big temptations. If we did, then our New Year's resolutions would all come true. So now the way I think about character is falling in love with the right things. And St. Augustine, who lived in about, I don't know, 1600 years ago, had this concept of higher and lower loves that we all love a lot of things, but some loves are higher than others. And so, for example, if you tell me a secret and I blab your secret at a dinner party, I'm putting my love of French, uh, my love of popularity over my love of friendship. And we all know that's disordered love. That's getting them in the wrong order. Friendship is higher than popularity. Or if I steal money from work, I'm putting my love of money over my love of, of my company. And we all know that's that's disordered love. So I and now think of character as falling in love with the right things and putting your love in order. 
and and so what what's the key for good character is not willpower it's motivation it's desire am i desiring the right things am i pointing toward the right stars and and getting your loves in order is, is a tremendously important task mm, so you fall in love with the right things i love that so character ultimately then in that case is something that doesn't happen because we can all fall in love with the right things um and right. and, and 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 then so rank ordering uh the things to fall in love with ultimately that's what you're saying um yeah and okay that, we're gonna go to you the gotta be competent um, at it sorry go on you, you how do you get you competent have to have skill how too. do you get competent well you, you once you fall in love with the thing say i fall in love with the idea of uh, a real, uh knowing fred the i have to ask you the right questions i have to not rush you so you feel your privacy is respected I have to uh, just walk with you, and then I have to reflect back what I think you're telling me. And these are all conversational skills. And so if I say I really want to get to know Fred because I really like Fred, but if I insult you, if I invade your privacy, I get in your face, that's bad skill. <laughs> and so it, there's a craft <laughs> to conversation and friendship. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, great. Um, um, well. I'd love to go to so uh, if, for, if folks who are watching can type in your questions. For, we'll, we'll start, you know, uh, responding uh, to those and give you a chance to, to ask David those questions. Um, but I guess before we do that, maybe David, one last question. You talk about you propose that joy is a better thing to aim for than happiness. Can you describe the difference between joy and happiness? Yeah. Well, I mentioned it briefly before. Happiness is when you win a victory. Joy is when you uh, lose any sense of yourself when you're not thinking about yourself. And so I had a friend who was a poet in Prague. Uh, and he was uh, sitting at his table writing a poetry. And a falcon landed on the windowsill. And he was struck by the beauty of the bird. And he just was looking at this incredibly beautiful bird. And he called his girlfriend who was in the shower. Come here, come here, you gotta see this bird. And so his girlfriend's coming out and they're looking at this beautiful bird and the bird turns, it had been looking at the street, it turns and locks eyes with my friend Chris. And he said, looking into the eyes of that bird was like looking into the centuries of nature. And he said it was a beautiful moment where he's looking into the bird, he's having sort of a spiritual experience, he's got his girlfriend standing dripping wet next to him. And he wrote a poem about it, the final stanza of which was, uh, I wish the moment would never end. And just like that, it vanished. So we have these moments where we're not thinking about ourselves. And I think those are moments of, of joy when you're lost mm. in nature or, or lost, you're lost. Mm. And, and, mm. They, and you come out different, a happy moment, you enjoyed it, but then you come out yourself. And a joyous moment, often mm. we come mm. out different. We've seen a different level of reality. Mm, mm, mm. Great. All right. So let's go go to some of the questions that have come in uh, from our viewers on YouTube. Um, and uh... all right. So the first question is from Tembe Kumalo, so joining us from South Africa, and she says, "Is it a good idea to try and make your career feed into your vocation?" Because sometimes the practical needs of earning a living seem to override the longing to fulfill one's vocation. Yeah, well, I would say if you can. Like, I became a writer at, at uh, five, like I said. And it, it's been a many decades since, and there have probably been not 200, year, 200 days where I haven't written. I write every morning. And I got lucky. It's not a career where you often make a living, but I adjusted my writing so I could get paid to do it and it, make it a career. So I, I probably a playwright or a short story writer, but instead I became a journalist. And so you newspapers will pay you as a journalist. And so I guess I adjusted my vocation, but I still feel it's like my vocation. Other people, uh, their career is different. Maybe their careers as a painter, but they can't get paid. So they do something to support the career. For a lot of people, their vocation is not necessarily like a craft or an art. 
It's a way of showing up in the world. And so a lot of people, I know a friend who's, whose vocation is hospitality. She's really good at hosting. And so you can do that vocation in a lot of different ways. Uh, you can do it in the hotel industry. You can open a restaurant. Uh, you can host conferences. And so it, it, when you think about what your vocation is, maybe it's best to think of it as a verb and not a noun. It's not like, oh, I'm in tech. It's, I really like charging people up. I like motivating people. And you can do that in a lot of different places. Or my skill is breaking down a number and statistically analyzing it. That's my vocation. You can do that in a lot of different places. So it, sometimes our vocation is not necessarily a job category. It's the thing that we're wired to do, the thing that makes us feel most alive. And I have a friend who hires people, and one of his questions is, uh, what, what are you doing when you feel most alive? And that's a good hmm. indicator of what you were wired to do. Hmm. What you were born to do. I love that. You know, we're all put on earth for a purpose. What do you, what, how do you um, know that you're on, on that track? What makes you feel alive? Excellent. I love that. Yeah. David, the next question is from Ted Schmidt. And Ted joins us uh, from Seattle, Washington, and uh, he's a wildlife conservationist. And um, he says, David, you write about communities often between people. Have you thought about the community with nature and with this increasingly small planet we share? And he says, my vocation, it truly found him, is wildlife, especially in Africa. And I question how we as a global society find a way to love and value this amazing planet rather than find it as a resource to exploit. Can you talk about how you see what you say about love and, 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 and what we value is or is not reflected action with other species and with nature. Yeah. You know, we're, we're shaped powerfully by the metaphors we use. And in the a couple hundred years ago, they just invented clocks. And so they saw society as a clock with a lot of different moving pieces that all had to fix together. I think that's the wrong metaphor for any human society and human relationships because we're not like objects you can take apart. Uh, we're more like clouds than clocks. Uh, we're, we're sort of emergent entities. And to me, the metaphors that I like are natural metaphors. I, I compare a community to a rainforest. And in a rainforest, there are all these different interconnections between the plant life, the wildlife, the insect life. And they all have their purposes. They all serve each other in a different way. And if you mess with one little piece, you're messing with the other piece. And so communities, we want it to look like a rainforest with a bunch of dense connections from the canopy to the root system. Uh, and so I, I think organic metaphors and, and nature is our guide here, not, not only our guide, but our home and our, the way we fit into the world. And so if we see our human societies as, as organic, evolving, natural environments, then I hope we'll be kinder to ourselves because we'll understand all the interconnections and I hope we'll be kinder to the planet. And I thank Ted for the work he does in the world. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Debbie Hazel. He joins us from New York, an old friend. Debbie, uh, I think we can bring you up to ask David the question live. Sure, hey Fred. Hi, David. Um, so I have two, two questions, but the first, the, the first one is um, public services is, is there to allow people to follow their vacations, uh, vocations. However, power corrupts, so, so power seems to be the motivation for a lot of people to go to public service. And even if it's not the motivation to go in, then you see sort of power politics everywhere, whether it's schools or universities or, or, or hospitals or NGOs, how, how do we solve that one? Yeah. Well, there's no eternal solution to that one because power has, has always been corrupted. Um, I would say, you know, when you look at people, you have to understand power. Power is a, a tool for, for good and evil. It's a means. And when I um, look at, say, Lyndon Johnson, uh, the American president of the 1960s, he was a, someone who craved power and often used it in ruthless ways. And yet he did a lot of good things. He passed the Civil Rights Act. And so that is the nature of, of politics. Um, I, I have a member of Congress that I know, and she hates her campaigns 
because she has to attack the other side. And she once showed me a piece of her campaign literature. She held it up like it was a diaper. She hated it. And she said, you don't win, you don't serve. Um, and so one has to deal with this. I guess the final thing I'd say, it's an insoluble problem, is that, um, you know, we, uh, the people I know in office are there for the right reasons. In most countries, and especially the U.S., life just, the political life is not that glamorous. You've got to do a lot of fundraising, you're constantly traveling, the committee hearings are boring. Most people I know go into it because they lo love their country and want to serve it. Uh, and yet they're stuck in an awful system that they have to do all the fundraising, that their constituents force them to be simplistic. And so the people I admire are the people who have bucked those corruptions. And I would say right now, to get a little political, there, there's a ten terrible corruption on the Republican side in America to just be pro-Donald Trump, and that's your whole belief system. And a few, like Mitt Romney, and there's a guy named Ben Sass, who said, I believe in certain principles. I'm not here to follow one guy. And so I think those are brave examples of people who have, um, have not let power corrupt them, not let the desire to stay in this job corrupt them. And we can point to them, but they are rare. The final thing I'll say, I don't, I don't know, I'm sure you've thought about this more than me, is I have a friend who says, if you don't care about politics, that's a luxury of someone who lives in a healthy society. In an unhealthy society where you could get shot in the back of the head or, or, or a bullet put in your brain, you don't have the luxury of not caring about politics. And the guy who told me this worked in the Bush administration and was instrumental in forming PEPFAR, which is the anti-HIV program that worked around the world to save tens of millions of lives. So he could say, I was part of a program that helped save millions of lives. And how fulfilling is that? And, and so when I, the people I do know who are in public service, they often describe their years in public service as the most crowded hours of their life, where they felt they had the biggest impact. So every, every business has its corruption, as you pointed to the one in politics, it's the corruptions of yeah. power. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for that great question. Uh, our next question is coming from uh, Michael Bryan from San Francisco. He's uh, involved in the world of finance. Mike, do you want to uh, come up and ask a question, David? Uh, sure. David, thanks for uh, taking the time. Really enjoy all your books and uh, your, your articles in the Times. Um, I, I guess my question is, you know, we, we seem to live in a society today globally um, where structures are in place, systems are in place to encourage people to pursue their short-term wants versus the long-term needs of a society. And so as, as parents, as, as leaders or aspiring leaders, how do we change the incentives? How do we encourage people to really follow that, that higher love that you talk about, that the long-term needs of a society uh, versus short-term desires? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, my business is culture, so I, I believe powerfully in culture, that cultures can change, and that cultures change when a small group of people find a better way to live, and the rest of us follow them. And so if, if we populate our, our ideas with examples of people who really lived for something for the long term, and my book Road to Character is a collection of those people, George Marshall, uh, Samuel Johnson, Dorothy Day, th these are people who serve as a model of how to live. And so culture, I think, is pivotally important. But then so are laws, and, and you're in finance, and a lot of the people I know who are CEOs feel they, uh, they have to, you know, they're worried about investors will, or shareholders will just crush them if they don't build the quarterly return. Uh, and so there, there are legal ways, I suppose, you would know better than I, I may throw this back at you, of how we can get companies thinking on a 10-year time horizon or a 50-year time horizon rather than a quarterly time horizon. But all, all of us face those kind of short-term incentive structures. I don't know if you have ideas. No, I, I guess real quick, if I could, I mean, my going back to your earlier comment about vocation, um, my, my interest is my two kids at home, not necessarily my career. And, and how, do you, how do you teach young people? 
how do you train young people to not necessarily focus on social media or influencers and, and, and learn to pursue long-term uh, needs? Yeah, yeah I, in my view, the answer to that one is some, a, a veterinarian in Oregon once emailed me and he said, what a wise person says is the least of that which they give. What gets remembered is their small actions and their very particulars. And then he wrote, never forget the message is the person. And when I think of my teachers in school, I don't remember what they said, but I remember how they were. And I, I, our kids are always watching how we are. Mm. Thank you. Mm. People remember what, it's similar to that, uh, Maya, is it a Maya Angelou quote that people will, uh, never remember what you say, they'll sometimes remember what you do, but they'll always remember how you feel. Um, uh, okay, last final question then from the audience is from Robin Whitaker. Robin has several questions for you, but maybe, Robin, why don't you pick one and, and ask David you know, that question. Robin's joining us. <laughs> thank Africa. you so much, Fred. Thank you, and thank you so much, David, for this um, wonderful conversation. So I'm, I'm going to choose my last question because it feeds in so beautifully to what you were just talking about, which is, do you have a sense... Um, that there is this growing level of synchronicity of consciousness coming through globally um, around the need to have societal transformation happen in a way that moves from, in Otto Schama's words, ego to eco. Um, there just seems to be, you know, this increasing number of connections between what Margaret Wheatley calls the islands of sanity um, and at the same time, this pullback to an old order. Do you feel like there is potential for us to make the societal revolution towards an ecosystemic approach to our globe, to our fellow human beings, um, to everything that makes us who we are? Yeah. There's a social theorist who has a, a, a theory called the ratchet, ratchet, pivot, ratchet theory of social change. And so she says, our human collective, we face a common problem and we figure out ways to solve it. And so in the 1960s, you know, around the world, we had also a lot more racial discrimination than we have now, that we still have a lot. Uh, we, women had much smaller roles in society uh, and people were hemmed in by culture. They didn't feel they could express themselves. So we had a global cultural change, which we call the 1960s. In France, they call it the 68ers. In America, it's sort of the hippies. Uh, and we changed the culture. And we went from a very conformist culture to a very individualistic culture. And now I mm -hmm. think we've had 60 years of too much of individualism. We've gone a little too far, a little too much self, not enough we. And I, I mm -hmm. sense all around the world, wherever I go, people want to find new ways to have we. And we're not mm -hmm. going to go back to the old ways, but we want to find new ways. And in many ways, what Fred and you guys are doing here is creating a new kind of community. And so people are, I think people, wherever I go, the, the key words I hear over and over, connection, relationship, community. And so we're mm -hmm. looking for we. And the, pro the problem is you have to chop up your old culture. That's the hatchet part before you go to the new. And those periods of hatchet are bumpy. They feel like everything's falling apart. But... Eventually you figure it out and the 60s ended and we had a new culture and you pivot and then you ratchet up again. And so I have great faith in human innovation. <laughs> uh, and I have great faith that people do figure stuff out and they form new things. And we may be just on this call, part of a, a new community that will connect people around the world in ways we couldn't before. And I think this is happening everywhere. Uh, I, find, I find groups and civic organizations in particular, ahead of politics, civic organizations in particular are rising uh, and are ready for COVID to end. And I am optimistic that the second half of this year is gonna be fantastic, that we're gonna be super appreciative of each other uh, and it'll feel like a new birth. Uh, and we'll be, well, gratitude is a good thing to be a wash in and I think we'll be a wash in. I had, if I can just quickly share with you, uh, in one of these beautiful uh, forums, we, we did a little bit of playing around with words and we came up with two words, which are my new favorite words, vulnerageous and we longing. 
we longing to be, um, which just so That's perfectly good. expresses new space. Yeah, perfect. Great. Well, thank you, Robin. And uh, that was the, the last question from the audience. And David, we, before we wrap up, there's a short little thing that I want to do with you, um, which is called the fire walk. So it just, um, if you can bear with us for a couple more minutes, we'll do that and then we can wrap up. Okay. All right, so David, um, this is going to be a little bit of a surprise to you, but basically I'm going to pose a series of rapid fire questions to you and you have to try and answer them as briefly as possible, maximum seven words or less. Right. So let's okay. get started. Gotcha. Being a police reporter taught me blank about storytelling. Uh, <laughs> it taught me uh, the basic facts, getting the facts right. All right. That's right. That's very. That, that's definitely one place where you got to get your facts right. My time as a bartender was complete. That sentence. The best job I ever had. Most fun community ever. <laughs> My favorite sound All is right. laughter around a bar late at night. All right, love that. What is the ideal opening sentence of your eulogy? Uh, David Brooks got better as he went along. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Self so, continuously improving David Brooks. Um, what is it like to be a Republican in the U.S. at this time? Torturous. <laughs> it's a very divisive party. <laughs> uh, a lot of people not feeling at home in any party, including me. All right. One thing still on your bucket list. Hmm. I need more hobbies. I'd love to play a musical instrument. All right. So we'll be seeing David... Brooks on a saxophone somewhere. We're looking out for that. Uh, one thing keeping you up at night. Uh, I guess it, it's the levels of loneliness and depression in, in society right now. Okay. Your favorite book growing up? My favorite what? Book growing up. Oh. Uh, in high school, I read a book called all the King's Men by Robert N. Warren, which was a beautiful book about politics. And it, it instilled in me a love of politics, or at least writing about it. Okay, okay. Now we know where David Brooks' politics career started. Speaking about school, what is the worst school grade you've ever received? And what subject oh, you I, I was not a good student. <laughs> I received Ds. I took Algebra 1 four times. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, guys. There's hope for all of us. <laughs> New York or D.C.? New York. All right. New it's York, my emotional home. One habit or ritual you formed during the lockdown? Uh, I take the same walk every day. I've taken it every single day, uh, listening to spiritual music. Okay, great. If you could trade lives with anyone for a day, who would it be? LeBron James. <laughs> Did you say LeBron James? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be a fabulous life for sure. Final, final one. If everyone left here with only one takeaway, what would it be? Uh, Joy over happiness. I'll go with that one. Uh, shoot for All joy. All right. Thank you. Shoot for joy. Joy over happiness. And, and with that spirit, uh, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Thank you, David, for being with us. And thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties. And David, you heard it here. He predicts that the second half of this year is going to be fabulous. It's going to be joyous, right? And, uh, you know, hopefully you got some uh, wisdom from the conversation today to help you find uh, your purpose in life and to live a more fulfilling uh, life, uh, a more joyous life, and a life where we all aim towards building our own moral character. So thank you so much, David, for joining us. It's been a pleasure catching up with you again, and I uh, look forward to seeing you on the other side of the pandemic. And uh, to all of you who joined us uh, on YouTube, um, please fill out the feedback form that's posted in the chat room to our Zoom viewers. 
you can stay on the line for further discussion. So thanks again, David. Really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you, Fred. Take care. Thank you. Pathway with Fred Swanica. Be sure to tune in next time and stay engaged with our other social media channels. For members joining us on Zoom, stay on the call as we continue the conversation.